This is More Than Money with Mapalo Marku, brought to you by Sasfin Wealth. Welcome to More Than Money. I'm Mapalo Marku, a personal finance columnist, and I love having money conversations that change people's perspective about finances. Why am I doing this podcast, you might ask? To talk about money. Not the paper stuff. I mean the baggage, the feeling, the emotional, heart-wrenching stuff. We find this conversation so uncomfortable to have. Which is why on this podcast, I have decided to have this very difficult conversations. We are going to scratch. We are going to have some difficult discussions because better money conversations lead to better money confidence. And healthy money dialogue leads to healthy money decisions. Today, I'm excited because we finally have the CEO of Sasfin Wealth, Errol Zeki. And today, he's putting himself forward to questions about how he manages his own money. Errol, thank you so much for being here. Oh, thank you very much. So I know you wear the CEO hat. And of course, you take a look at how you manage other people's money and how your business operates in that space. But today, I want you to take off the CEO hat and I want to talk to Errol, the man. So I just wanted to find out, getting into the financial services industry, was it something that you had always wanted to do from perhaps high school or university? Did you know that this is the industry you wanted to get into? Absolutely not. I had absolutely no idea. Um, And I certainly didn't understand this industry at that age. I knew I was good at some things and not as good as other things. So anything to do with maths or accounting or physics or those kinds of things, literature, not so much. So I kind of started drifting towards anything that that entailed that and and started with accounting and and become. But um, I was well into my studies before I came across the investment industry and, and having a better understanding of how that fits together. And when I say better understanding, it was still it was still a very vague idea of it. But, um, you know, then kind of I felt that that was definitely a direction I wanted to go in. But I know people who, you know, when they were 10 years old, knew they want to be a, a <laughs> CA or a doctor or a lawyer or a singer or whatever the case might be. I was not one of those people. I kind of found this as I as I went along. Who were you as a child at 10 years old? Who did you want to be? What were your aspirations or what did you think life would turn out to be? Um, Honestly, I can't remember, but if I had to think about it, probably something to do with sport. I don't think that a business career was really what I thought about when I was 10. Funnily enough, it was my son's graduation from his preschool this morning. And they were asking, what do you want to be when you grow up? And his answer was, he wants to be a surfer. And I was like, oh boy, you know, we live in Joburg, so um, (laughs) I'm not sure. (laughs) going to be a little a, a little tough so to be honest with you I don't remember you know I, I think and you know like like most 10 year old boys I just wanted to play with my mates and uh, spend as much time on a sports field as possible but is it an industry that you would encourage your kids to get into and thrive that's a very good question I've never thought about it the short answer is not necessarily I think that every person you know we're all so unique and need to find our own way in life in terms of what speaks to us and what our passion is. You know, I think purpose is, is very important in life. And if you're doing something that doesn't feel like you have purpose or that you know, you're, you're moving towards something that you're passionate about, um, I think that's a wrong move. What I would encourage very strongly, regardless of the direction that they take, is to have a certain level of, let's call it financial literacy. So just understand money, understand how it works, understand how to work with money, understand how to think about it. And it, and it is different for everybody. And I think that's part of this whole campaign at Sassman, this whole money is more than money, is exactly that. You know, money is an exceptionally emotional uh, topic. It's very difficult for many people to talk about. Um, it's almost taboo in, in, in many cultures. I think in most cultures, you know, people don't just sit down and start talking about their money or what they earn. And we've come up with this purpose at Sassman Wealth to enable our clients to reach their global investment goals, uh, to retire with dignity and to leave a lasting legacy. Now, you know, there's so many elements to this and it really is so different and unique to each individual. And and everyone has a, a very different goal. And when we talk to lasting legacy, you know, it means completely different things to different people. You know, for some, it's about building multi-generational wealth. For others, it's, you know, having the means to to enhance the, the lives of others, you know, whether that be educating their children or adding value in some other way, that something that they're passionate about. You know, this could be in a financial way. It could just be 
having the financial means to give of their time. You know, for someone else, it might mean yeah. traveling the world. Uh, it could be a, a combination of, of, of many things. And so, no, I don't think boxing them into the career is, is so much it. But we live in a world that has a financial system. And it is a system, yeah. let's just be clear, yes. right? It's not, it's not tangible. Um, it is a system. It's a system that allows us to trade and allows people to live their lives and, and, and allows economies to function for society to progress. So I think they must follow their passion. However, I think having a level of understanding of money and what money means to you would be very important for me for them to explore. You know, it's very different from how we grew up where our parents told us you have to be a doctor, you have to go out and get the specific degree because the potential for you to make a living out of it is so much more. It is very different to when we grew up, right? When we grew up, you know, it was kind of, well, if you choose a profession, right, when whether that be an accountant or a lawyer or a doctor or a plumber or an electrician, pick a trade or a profession or whatever the case might be, and you are guaranteed to have the means to generating a living or making a living or generating an income, right? That, that, that's become a lot more complicated, right? Many of the top jobs that exist today did not even exist when I was a student. So how do you even plan or train for for that. So yes, it is a very different world. And directionally, it's going to be very different for children growing up today. So, you know, we need to teach children to be able to think for themselves. It might become less about a professional qualification and more about the ability to solve problems, to think more broadly, and I think, you know, to be open-minded. And I think that this is not something new. I think it's been happening over, over a very long time. But more and more, the ability to build relationships and to connect emotionally with people is actually almost more important than the material that you learn in whichever profession you're in. Because ultimately, you know, everything that you do is about uh, managing relationships. At the core of it, this podcast is to teach people that it is more than just about money. When did you start being aware of financial literacy and the impact of it? or aware that money is more than just money? Everyone grows up in, in, in very different circumstances. I think in the South African context, I am fortunate that I feel that I grew up relatively privileged, certainly not wealthy, but privileged by South African standards because, I mean, many people in our country and many others are only concerned with putting the next meal on the table. They're not even thinking past, you know, savings, etc. So I think something that I did realize at a, at a fairly early age is that there is certain privilege that comes with the ability for someone to earn a living, you know, to, to be independent. There's a certain level of dignity to it. I think in terms of raising children and financial literacy, it's, it's not just about understanding those things, but it's about appreciation. I think appreciation is very, very important to teach in this whole journey. One of the big flaws of capitalism is is that it's created this massive divide between the ultra wealthy and the rest of the world. I can't remember exactly what the stats are, but something ridiculous like 50% of the wealth in the world sits in the hands of 1% or whatever the case might be. It's come with a lot of other benefits. It's not a perfect system. It's the best system that we have. I think it's been the most successful system. But there's definitely been many negative elements to the system as well. And, you know, this this drive to just generate, you know, const, more, you know, you know more. more and more and more, that's good for some people, but not for everyone. And, and, and I come back to what I was saying earlier about this money is more than money and our purpose. And it means very different things to different people. What does it enable? Does it provide just the security that you require to go to bed and sleep well at night? Is it more about education or a cause that's important to you or, or whatever the case might be? And it comes back to this EQ question, right? Does it drive mm. purpose for you? At the end of the day, it's a means to an end. And it, and it means different things to different people. But it's What not does just, it mean to you, Errol? It means stability and security for my family. Honestly, I think that is definitely at the the center of it. Now, Errol, what are some of the things that you do spend your money on that are not completely serious? So my wife and I actually have this discussion all the time about what's important to us. And it's not things. And for some people it is. And, and I'm not saying that anybody's purpose or, or what they strive for is wrong or right. But where we've landed in many discussions around this is for us, it's about experiences. 
you know, life is short and we all are very busy. And in this industry in particular, maybe I won't encourage my kids to come to the industry just because of you know, the demands, <laughs> the demands on your time. Um, you know, it is a very, very competitive space and it does require a lot of dedication and investment in terms of time. So you become time poor. So it becomes about how do you best spend that time? And so where we've landed is that what it means for us and what's important to us more than generating mountains and mountains of money is having the means to have experiences, spending time with our children, traveling, we love to travel. So when we get the opportunity, we, we love to travel both, both locally and abroad. So yes, um, in a nutshell, for me, it's about the privilege of being able to have experiences that provide a fulfilling life. At what point in your life did you get your own finances right? Have you always been a very prudent and cautious person with your money? Well, you're making an assumption that I have it right. Sure, maybe I don't. Um, <laughs> <laughs> we would hope you no. have it right, <laughs> No, I mean, my, 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 you know, funnily enough, my wife and I are both in this industry. Maybe the second question then, between you and your wife, who is better with money? I'm going to get in a lot of trouble for saying that she's, she's definitely better at spending it than I am. But I'm saying that very tongue in cheek. She's actually, to be quite honest, she is the person in our house that kind of constructs our budget and um, et cetera, et cetera, and makes sure that we plan for different things, whether that be school fees or, you know, being able to go on a December holiday or whatever the case might be. She actually manages that process. But, um, you know, you go back to, you know, this whole money thing and importance and whatever. I do think that... It is important. I went back to, you know, that capitalism is not a perfect system. It's definitely flawed, but it's by far the best system that we have. You know, part of my attraction to this, to this industry is that you need a functioning financial system for the world to work, right? And all the challenges and all the things that we struggle with in the world, and there are many at the moment, right, whether it be environmental problems or social problems, I mean, you know, there's a very, very long list. I believe very strongly that you cannot solve real-world problems without commercial solutions. So, you know, this thing of purpose-led capital and being able to make an impact, for me, is very fulfilling from a career perspective in this industry and in money. And so profits and income statements and balance sheets are very, very important. Looking after our clients and their money is very, very important. Making sure that we cater for the very unique needs of different individuals and what's important to them is very, very important. It's critical, you know, because... The financial system has to operate in a particular way for society to continue functioning. These economic solutions or commercial solutions to real world problems, I, I think is, is really true. Charity is really important. I'm all for it. And to the extent that someone is able to be charitable, they should be. But charity will only take you that far. You need to solve it in different ways. You are listening to More Than Money, a podcast collaboration brought to you by Sasfin Wealth. At Sasfin Wealth, we empower our clients to reach their global investment goals, to retire with dignity, and to leave a lasting legacy. If you would like to have real money conversations, visit sasfin.com forward slash wealth and talk to us. Enjoy the rest of the podcast. You mentioned you take care of your clients, of course, but who takes care of Errol's finances? Do you have a financial planner and are your assets sitting with Sasfin itself or do you have a diversified portfolio outside of Sasfin? I have a diversified portfolio. As I said, my wife's also in the industry and she's a financial planner and we have solved for our unique needs and I do use a number of investment um, professionals with varying skills within um, Sasfin to construct that. You know, the analogy for me is, you know, we go back to sort of the absolute sort of uniqueness of people and their needs. And one analogy that I often think about is it's a bit like an artist, right? So an artist will blend, uh, you know, colors on a palette to, to create a unique masterpiece, right? As an individual, you're going to blend financial elements like savings, investments, but also your dreams and your objectives to sort of paint your financial future. And it, it's different for everybody. So, you know, you need different expertise and different skills. And I certainly do leverage different expertise and skills within our business to help paint that picture. Have you ever made a financial mistake and you thought, goodness, perhaps I should have not spent my money on that? And that is either as an individual or the both of you as a couple. Oh, so many. I'll tell you my first one, which was sort of a life lesson in investing, right? I believe very strongly in get your asset location right and be a long-term investor. 
timing markets is for fools. It doesn't work. You need a long-term plan and you need long-term goals and objectives and you need to work towards those. And this is where using the expertise of financial planners and wealth advisors and portfolio managers and, and, and the rest becomes um, really, really important. But a bit of an embarrassing story, but I'll, I'll, I'll tell it anyway. So my very first job, which was on a trading desk when I was young and you know, didn't know what I didn't know and thought I knew a lot. The very first bonus I got, I traded in the futures market. I managed to trade my first bonus to zero in two weeks. It was such an important moment and such an important lesson, right? Mm. Um, and I can assure you that any investment professional gets humbled by the market at some point. Excellent. No one is capable of getting everything right all of the time. Mm. That is why diversification is so important. That's why long-term strategic asset allocation is so important. That's why taking a long-term view is so important. And I, you know, I paid these school fees as a youngster, but I think they were important lessons to learn. There are some things that, that um, doesn't matter how many times somebody tells you it, you have to learn it yourself. <laughs> Hopefully the clients that we have and that we, and that we speak to don't need to learn those lessons by themselves and can take you know, our learnings and our experience and our expertise to paint their own financial story. Absolutely. And I like the fact that, you know, you learned them at a young age, so the effects are not as hard. So with your wife, was it something where you got married, you started discussing money from the get go, or you just sort of assumed, you know, we both know what's going on and we don't really need to discuss money? Or what was that conversation like between you and her? This is very different for every couple, depending on their own story and their background and set of circumstances. In our circumstances, it's something that we've been very open about. Uh, we lived together for some time before we got married quite late in life and had been in relationship with my wife for many years before we did decide to, to get married and were and have always been very, very open and transparent about it and have kind of considered it as a communal pot. You know, what's mine is yours and what's yours is mine, you know. So that's been our approach. That's just where we landed based on the circumstances that we came into the relationship. What is really important, and I think one of the, the really important lessons and, and, and at least something that we understood being in this industry, if I could give anybody the best piece of advice, the best time to start saving was whenever, you know, when you were 18 or 20 or when you started your first job or whatever the case might be. And the next best time is today. The time value of money or the compounding impact of market growth and interest and so on, um, wasn't Einstein that called it the eighth wonder of the world, right? Eighth compounding. Wonder. It is a real thing, right? The reality is even if it's small amounts, it might not seem meaningful at the time. But what that does over 20 or 30 or 40 years is, is quite incredible, that compounding mm. effect. So make a start. Start saving. If you're looking for financial well-being and financial freedom as you go through life, financial well-being is not about how much you earn or how much you make. It's about how much you save. Why do you think it's such a difficult concept for people to get compounding? You know, I often hear people, even when I'm doing my talk, say, okay, but what is the interest I'm going to earn? How do you actually explain to someone who has never invested, someone who has never been in the equity market, to say this is compound interest, you know, just to make it simple for people? Sure, to make it simple. <laughs> You're catching me out a little bit because I'm trying to think of a good way to, to explain it. But the reality is, you know, if your money is in the equity market and the equity market does what it has on average over the long term, you know, I'm not sure exactly where it is, but let's call some, you know, somewhere between 12 and 13 percent or whatever the case might be. You are literally doubling your money every five years, just to give you an idea. So it's an exponential curve. So in other words, the more you save and the longer you're in the market, the more the growth on that initial investment that you made because it's interest on interest on interest. So as that capital base grows, it's, it's more and more. Maybe just to drive the point home around compound interest, I want you to give us an example of someone who starts investing perhaps at the age of 25 and they are investing a thousand rand a month versus someone who says, you know what, I'll wait until all my ducks are in a row and they only start investing at the age of 35 and they invest 2,000 rand per month. How does compound interest affect that time gap? So, I mean, I can't give you exact numbers, but there is a lot of research on this. And for example, someone who only starts saving in their 40s versus someone who starts saving in their early 20s. 
person in their forties can never catch up, even if they're earning a lot, lot more money than what that person was in their in their twenties, right? It can't get caught up unless there's some big capital injection. You know, someone builds a big business and you know releases a lot of capital, wins the lottery, or whatever the case might be. I'm not talking about a normal person going through life, building their career and, and earning. But to go back to your earlier question, why it's so difficult for people, is that as one progresses through life and you earn money, you know, and we spoke about experiences or maybe it's material things, whatever the case might be, it's a very difficult discipline to mm. almost pay yourself before you start paying others, right? Live within your means. And just because you're getting an increase, right, don't now increase your lifestyle by that yeah. Six or seven percent, or maybe you got a nice promotion, which is twenty percent. You up your lifestyle and you don't save. You need to be clear about what you save every month and do your budget after that, right? So be yes. very, very clear yeah. on that. And one of the easiest places to start, right, is to use the mechanisms of retirement funds, whether it's your company's retirement, you know, pension or provident fund, or it's a retirement annuity, whatever the case might be. How many people have you heard? when they do have a pension or provident fund and they complain and say, you know what, if they just gave me all of my money into my account, I would make sure that I save and invest. And I often say, no, no, hold on, I hear you, but what is it that you're currently doing? Whatever it is that you're currently doing right now is a true reflection of what you would do were you to receive the entire amount into your account. If you're not doing it, you just don't know how to do it and you probably won't do it. But that's why I say, one of the easiest ways is something that kind of comes off of your salary. Maybe your company has a retirement fund. If it doesn't, you can have a debit order straight into a retirement annuity and, and there are big tax advantages to this as well. But if you don't see it, right? So in, in other words, if that money has already been saved before you start paying whatever you're paying, whether it be your bond or um, shopping or buying food or you know whatever the case might be this and that and you live within that that's the easiest way to do it because you mentally set yourself at a level and you live within those means if you can do more over and above that that's great but if you do nothing else at least just start with that just start with that because you don't see it right and as you you know progress through life and you know you get increases and whatever just make sure that you keep pace with those increases with that inflation right yes. and exclude that from your budget completely and this is not always possible right because you know we live in a country where as i said earlier you know many people don't 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 have the the ability to save right it's more about just putting food on the table but also when you change jobs you know if you're given that opportunity to kind of take that money out and i go do something mm. with it I encourage everybody very strongly, if you are capable of leaving it and preserving that money and just allowing that to continue growing through your life, do that and keep adding to it. So if you do that as a minimum, just do that. If you can do more, definitely do more. Mm. What is the best advice you've ever received so far, either in your personal life or in your career? And what advice also would you like to give to your children? It is the conversation we just had. Start saving early, even if it's such small amounts that you, you know, that it doesn't make sense to you now. It will make sense in the future. What car do you drive, Errol? I always um, buy secondhand cars and always drive them for 10 years. Once again, personal preference. Why do you think that there's this notion that every five years one must change their car or even people thinking that secondhand cars are not the best? You see people driving really amazing, fancy cars, and there's nothing wrong with that. Like you said, it's a personal choice and personal preference, right? But where do you think it comes from, the desire and the drive to change a car every single five years, where we're always consuming, wanting the latest shiny new toy? Yeah, I just think everybody is different and, and, and has a different um, view of things. I work with some people who could certainly afford <laughs> much, much fancier cars than they, than they drive. And then there are other people, to them, that is important. To me, experiences are important. To somebody else who might love nice cars, um, I don't think there's anything wrong with that. This is not about driving a nice car. It's not about nice things. It's not about any of that stuff. Decide what's important to you and live within a construct or within the means where you are saving before you spend on whatever you're spending on. No one's in a position to tell somebody else what's important or what their purpose should be or how they should behave or what should be important to them, right? That's a very unique, once again, going back to this very unique and personal 
thing. I think you know, this is for everybody to figure out for themselves. But we can't all have everything that we want. That's just not how life works. Being grateful for what you have and planning for the long term, I just believe will make for a much happier life. I really don't want to sound like I'm preaching about how to live life. You know, do we move outside of our budget? Often. You know, then, then, you know, then we have to kind of, you know, catch up or make it up in other ways. Life is life, you know, live your life. If you're going to try and kind of make everything too rigid and too impersonal, it also doesn't work. So I was fortunate enough to learn this idea of the long-term diversified game. How has your money management and financial planning changed since you guys had kids? I'm very glad you asked that question. It's been a major shift. We've definitely become a lot more conscious of it. So, so we've, we've always been relatively disciplined. But as soon as you kind of now have this long-term responsibility for somebody else and a long road to walk, you know, in terms of looking after, nurturing, educating, it definitely has brought it more to the fore. It has emphasized the importance of gratitude, of enough is enough, with children as well. They need to learn certain disciplines and that they can't have everything that they want. That's not the way the world works yeah. for, for anybody. Children don't learn from what you tell them, right? It doesn't work that mm. way. They follow example. They're going to, they're going to learn from the way you doing. behave. That's the way that they're going to behave, you know. Our parents used to say, do as you told, not as I do, right? And um, that doesn't work. But it certainly has brought a lot more seriousness to the importance of thinking long term. So, you know, when you say money is more than money, in this case, money is much more than money, right? Because it is about being able to provide our children with the ability um, or the opportunity to pursue whatever their dream might be. And that dream might have nothing to do with money, but we're certainly going to have to plan for providing them the resources or the platform or the opportunity to go and pursue whatever that dream might be. What is the legacy you would like to leave for your children? I go back to gratitude. I think it's a very, very important practice and skill to learn. So you're not always chasing something else. You're living life now. You're living it in the moment. Money is not a destination. It's a journey, which is very important. So, you know, that's, I go back to this not being too rigid. You know, you don't stop living your life because you feel that you have to reach some quantum or financial goal at a particular point. So I think you can plan for the future and still live in the moment. Thank you so much, Errol. This was a very different interview to what I was expecting. I didn't, you know, <laughs> I didn't, I didn't know we were going to be talking about me. I've really enjoyed it and really appreciated it. Thank you so much. This was a Sassman Wealth Podcast. Visit sasfin.com forward slash wealth for more information.